Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Shutterstock.com. With over 1 million high quality video clips, Shutterstock helps you take your creative projects to the next level. For 30% off your new account, go to Shutterstock.com and use offer code FRAMERATE8. The following is rated S for spoilers. In a world where movies have been replaced by TV as the medium for grown-ups, comes the best HBO-style drama that can't use the F word or show any boobs, yet is so good, it got TV snobs to finally shut up about The Wire. Breaking Bad. The show so powerful, you binge watch it on Netflix. So all-consuming, you push it on your friends even if they don't watch TV. And so addicting, you can't shut up about it. It's basically like drugs. Journey to scenic New Mexico. Because state tax laws make it cheaper to shoot there than Los Angeles. And meet chemistry teacher Walter White. He's got the kind of cancer that makes you cough a lot. Woo! Welcome to Frame Rate episode 137. I'm Tom Merritt. Hey, I'm and Brian Brushwood. Sun. Oh, hey, hey, look, Brian Brushwood is here. Uh, it's nice to have you in on the show, Brian. Yeah, well, uh, well, that's a weird thing to say. Um, I'm I'm here. I've always been here. I've never not oh, been I've here. Got our, our, my old co-host from Frame Rate, as we all know, is Scott Johnson. Uh, he left the show a couple weeks ago, but he's he's with us as well. Yeah, that sounds... I'm, just, I'm just trying to help uh, transition. That's all this is. I'm not. I'm. You guys tell me how you want to do this. How you want to exchange the baton? It's fine. Whatever you See, want. See, this is. It's. It's like you guys are a fever dream, and you didn't actually exist. And now you're talking about like there. There was there like a sideways universe where somebody else. We're also thinking about bring, I... bringing on Ayaz Akhtar, a co-host of Tech News Today, host of Know How, is with us. Hey, Ayaz. I'm like the spare tire, guys. In case both of those guys fall off, I'm right there. <laughs> I'll just be here. <laughs> You're that weird little rubber tire that's buried in my trunk. That's right. I'm that's the dummy tire. Donut. <laughs> donut. I've got uh, your spare yeah, tire frosted. right here. So, uh, Brian, you know, if you do well, we might keep you around. <laughs> okay, great. Well, I certainly hope that uh, this all works out for the best. How does this show usually begin? I'm unfamiliar with the format. Oh, oh, well, we talk a lot about cord cutting. Uh, it's the show that thinks you ought to be able to watch your TV when you want, how you want, where you want, without any darn interference from anybody on whatever device you darn well please. And we aim to give you the info you need. We always start with the big story. This just in, the big story. Our big story usually doesn't take this much setup, so bear with me. <laughs> Stephen Max Patterson on Quartz uh, wrote a story about data from PricewaterhouseCoopers Global Entertainment and Media Outlook predicting that between 2013 and 2017, over the top, which is what they call things like Roku and Apple TV, and traditional TV like cable and satellite delivery will both grow. Uh, and in the article, Patterson says... Over-the-top TV has only reinvented a single part of the TV business, streaming archival movie and television content over the Internet, replacing physical DVDs and time-shifted DVR replay of TV programs. To displace incumbents, over-the-top TV has to continue to change TV business models in ways that appeal to customers and attract content owners. Now, that's interesting because Ben Elowitz, CEO of Wet Paint, wrote a guest column on All Things D today, taking Netflix to task for promising never to do live streaming. He's like, no, you absolutely should do live streaming. Netflix Live would not only bring new must-haves to its offering, but could potentially convert tens of millions of unhappy cable customers into Netflix subscribers. It would also give Netflix the edge to charge more for added value down the road. This all 
leads to us looking at the Wall Street Journal story about Sony and Viacom apparently coming to the principal agreement for Viacom to give their channels to Sony for an over-the-top, internet-only cable service. Peter Kafka speculates that this will not be disruptive. It will be delivered exactly the way cable television is now, with bundles and everything. Uh, the negatives are no real disruption. Now, the positives would be that you could get it anywhere in the United States, conceivably. So it might provide more competition over the local monopolies. Given all of this stuff, is, is Internet television delivered by a, a Sony the revolution? Or will it come from a Netflix or a Hulu? It, it sounds to me like a lot of these, uh, the, the, of the statements you gave, uh, a couple of them strike me as having flawed theses, which is uh, basic, uh, for starters, the fact that it, it is implied that in order for everyone to cut the cable, in order for the revolution, whatever that means to happen, uh, we need to stop paying cable companies and now pay one specific prov provider like Netflix or whoever online to do it. Uh, Netflix should not do live events because what we're, we're not leaving cable for one company who provides something online. We're leaving cable for a wide array of highly fragmented options provided by different companies at different times. So what will happen is, uh, yes, uh, uh, the article that says Netflix is not creating enough content in order to get people to cut the cord. And basically the thesis is um, uh, people watch 144 hours of television per month and uh, they're only watching 3.8 minutes per day of over-the-top TV on Netflix because there's only so much content on there. The problem with this is from the beginning, it takes the idea that if you shove your left hand into water that is, you know, mixed with salt and super chilled to zero degrees Fahrenheit, and then other water that's on the verge of boiling at 200 degrees, then on average, therefore, you, are, uh, you must be comfortable because that's about 100 degrees or what you would get in a hot tub. It's, it's a flawed premise. The idea that, that you average all the people who don't watch a single damn thing over the top networks with all the people who are trying to cut the cord and come up with this BS number of what he says, 3.8 minutes per day, and that therefore that means there's not enough content out there uh, is, is ridiculous to me. So if you, if you take the more realistic view that what's happening is the way this will, will pivot is there will be two or three really good reasons to quit cable. You'll go with Netflix, you'll go with Amazon, and then overnight, within one year, you're going to see 20 channels, uh, maybe 40 channels. If you've got someone like Viacom flipping the switch all at once, suddenly, as long as you have some form of validation, you can now get them online, and nothing major is going to have to change because you'll flip a switch and you'll watch on a monitor instead of your living room TV. So my biggest problem with this is Sony is literally shifting... Well, the deal with Sony, potentially, is literally just shifting your cable subscription to another cable subscription that is Viacom only, which is a lot. They have a lot of stuff on cable, but whatever. It's still just Viacom. Uh, let's say they start with them. They're going to shift that cable subscription to another subscription that now you're just getting the same content over Internet and likely getting it at lesser quality and things that you could get over a cable box. So I don't love that solution. I'm happy that Sony's going to have a solution for people like me who've cut the cord a long time ago, and here's a new way for me to get this stuff. I don't love that, but I could not agree with Brian Moore about this, this sort of these flawed numbers. The idea that there are full-blown cable lovers, subscribers, slash satellite subscribers running around the house going, oh, let me just take in all this content that I'm getting on cable, but give me five minutes. I just need five minutes to go just get a little something off Netflix. I'll be right back. Okay, I'm good. Now I'm just going to watch the rest of my day's content on one of these cable channels I'm paying for over cable. It's a serious, silly comparison. There's a serious flaw in doing that, and I think it muddies the already muddy water. Uh, that we have to deal with when trying to figure out what our best choices are. I will say this, Brian's weird uh, hot tub analogy kind of just turned me on just a tiny little bit, just a little bit. <laughs> just a little bit. It's understandable. Yeah. I, I, Who can blame I can't, I can't say, I can't speak for anyone else, uh, and, and I won't say anything more. But <laughs> are we missing the point here? Like, okay, maybe the numbers are flawed, but there are fewer hours of television being watched on Netflix and Hulu than there are on cable because there just still are a ton more people watching cable TV out there. So that aside, what will, what will move them towards internet? And I think the live thing is right. I, I also disagree. I don't think Netflix should do live, but I think somebody will be able to come in and say, yeah, we'll, we'll stream 
We'll stream NFL Live. We'll stream NHL Live. We'll stream the Tonys Live. The, I, I think you do need that to move people off of cable. What I do wonder, though, is if I sign up for the Sony over-the-internet television service and it's just as great as cable and I'm getting it over the internet, am I a cord cutter or am I just doing the same thing that everybody that has Time Warner and Comcast and DirecTV are doing right now just happens to be delivered over the internet instead? Is, that, is yeah, it actually no, cord cutting? I believe that is not cord cutting. That's exactly my point. And moreover, this idea that Netflix shouldn't shouldn't or shouldn't be doing live content i think people are missing real, really important point and the reason netflix is saying what they're saying netflix doesn't have two infrastructures they're two very different infrastructures to live to deliver uh, de uh on demand content which is what they do now and live content when you're having live events let's say a boxing match the way hbo does it because hbo really is netflix's best analog right so hbo can come in and say all right live boxing match live from vegas here we go boom live television netflix doesn't have that infrastructure it's not the same infrastructure as on-demand tons of archive content to play at various times during the day to lots of different locations. Live means everybody comes at once. you got to be able to serve that. you got to be able to serve it uh, well because you're paying. everyone's paying for this. They're not ready to take that on. Nobody is because they're two separate kinds of things, and they've never invested in that. So I'm not surprised they said no to that at all. Well, HBO and all these other guys make those events, live events, available on-demand later on. So the thing is, if Netflix could, like partner up with somebody who knows live that could be helpful the real thing is i think with all of these things whether you're a cord cutter or not it's really about what experience is, is going to be different because i don't think that the label matters if you're a cord cutter because you decided to not have a cable coming in but it's it is the one from your internet provider it's still a cable it doesn't really make a difference it's just how you're consuming content so if you've got netflix and they've got live content or not it doesn't really make a difference i think we've got a discoverability problem when it comes to online content, and same thing with just regular old cable companies. Because when you get this huge pipe of just every millions of channels, you just can't find anything. And just because you've got millions of hours of content doesn't mean you're watching it. So if, if these things like Sony can have the ability to have recommendations that you're actually watching more and more content and you're actually more engaged, that's way more interesting than just saying, oh, well, they've just put cable on the Internet. What are you going to get out of it if it's not better content? Let me tell you, if I was going to make a prediction, and this is based on nothing but just a hunch, uh, the, the one of the one of the ideas that we just heard expressed was that Netflix should do live events. Uh, I I don't think Netflix has any interest, and I think they're serious when they say we're not going to do it. But I do think that YouTube not only has the interest, but actually could come to dominate live events. YouTube could be the place we go. We have seen little hints that YouTube certainly has the infrastructure and they have the desire to be the place uh, that covers, uh, you know, those electric moments. That moment that the whole world stopped to watch a Red Bull advertisement jump out of a balloon at the top of the sky, uh, that was electric and amazing. I mean, that was as big as any CNN moment I remember happening in the last five years. And I think YouTube uh, is really interested in pushing forward and dominating that, st that space. Yeah, I, I completely I think, agree. And also, and they're that they're the whole infrastructure question, I think you just answered it. They've not only just showing hints, they are full on rolling out individual based. I mean, they've just up to what, 100, 100 uh, subscriptions will get you live streaming capability now as a user of YouTube. That's nothing. That's hardly anybody subscribing to your thing. So they are opening the floodgates already to individuals. That infrastructure is huge in its own right. But they also do political events. They did stuff with the debates. They'll continue to do this they'll do it slowly but they'll continue to do it to the point that they probably will be the dominant place or maybe they want to be the dominant place where you get lots of archival stuff but also the real-time stuff and that maybe is ultimately how they trump netflix a little bit uh, maybe they beat them on the live side i'm not even arguing for netflix to do things live but i can see the pressure and i can see the desire i mean certainly here we are on a network doing a show that we could all do offline if we wanted but we're doing it live for a reason and there are there people want live content Netflix may have to let it slip a little bit if they don't, you know, if they don't want to get put behind, especially live, by YouTube, yes. YouTube will kill them. People want live content when it is appropriate, when it's like, I have to watch it now. It's breaking news. It's a live event like sports or the, you know, the Olympics being one of the biggest examples of it. But there's also the, the lean back effect of I just want to have something on. I just want to have something on in the background. Nobody on the internet is doing the I just want to have something on. A few people are doing the live event coverage, but most of it's sucked up by the big networks. I think Sony coming in, if they, if they come in and say, hey, it's just like cable television, but it's on the internet, 
I think it might end up being a failure because what people want on the internet is they want all of their things and they want them when they want them, where they want them, just like we say at the beginning of the show. So they have to provide it in a way that says we've made it easier, better and cheaper. Or I don't think it's going to catch on because the people who are used to cable the way it is now and are fine with it aren't going to switch to an internet only version unless there's some advantage. And the cord cutters aren't going to embrace it if it actually limits the way they do things from the way they do things now. Let's uh, let's move on to another big story. Stop everything. It's another big story. Because what will possibly get them to cut the cord and move into internet video is buying one of these set-top boxes. In fact, uh, a TDG research survey found that broadband users with connected TVs, that could be a smart TV like a Samsung, or it could be a TV with a Roku plugged into it. Uh, they compared that to, uh, whether, let's see, they say they are, people with those connected TVs are twice as likely to cut the cord as broadband users who don't connect their TV to the internet. So as soon as you've got the ability to use the internet, suddenly people go, huh, I can watch a bunch of stuff over there. Now, I think it's interesting that they go with the headline, uh, why Apple TV is a cord cutter's gateway drug, because um, I, as long as I'm that's in the business That's just SEO. Of, that's I'm, just I, trying to I, grab I, it. I, I understand that, but, but, but it is significant because you don't accidentally buy an Apple TV. You go out and you decide, like, I want this Apple TV. I want the experience of being able to download stuff, whatever. If, if we're going to pick a proper gateway drug, it's got to be either the PS3 or the Xbox, because you buy those for something besides watching, you know, the, the, or having the cord cutter experience, and you sort of slip in there. You know, you every time you log in, it reminds you, hey, this content's now available on Xbox Live. You could get it immediately, or you could buy it for Microsoft points if they're still doing that, and, and so on. So it's like, I think that is the much more powerful seductive force to get people to test out the cord cutting experience. Um, you know, but, but, but you're right. I, I, I understand why they would say Apple TV, but I think uh, uh, to be a little more appropriate, they should mention a game console for that. Well, maybe. Well, all, but, all but things D is just, we're, let's, we're getting totally away from the main part of the story. TDG didn't say anything about Apple TV better than anything else. All things D wrote a headline that is going to grab people's attention because people see Apple and they click. That's right. all that. But the, so they should, I mean, we, if we're talking consoles and we're talking about these gateway, quote unquote, gateway drugs to, to cord cutting, it's very interesting. I think that we're talking about a kind of a current gen experience. If you buy a 360 or a PS3 now, you'll find these apps. Well, these are cool. And this is your way of sort of getting your feet wet in that, con <clears throat> in that content, maybe a little easier on a PS3 because you don't have a paywall keeping you out of Netflix, but that's going away with the Xbox one. But here's the problem. The Sony and Microsoft are taking very two different tacks moving forward, and 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 the two most popular set top boxes will be these next gen consoles, at least in theory. And if that holds true, Sony's going a very different route. Sony's saying, get a bunch of ICOM enter entertainment and all a bunch of other digital stuff, and let's have that be the way you get it. You'll get it over the internet. You'll get it online. That's kind of a much more cord cutting experience than what Microsoft play is. Microsoft's play is with the one. They may change this. They've been changing a lot of stuff about it. So who knows what's going to happen in the end? But their push is connect us to your cable box, connect us to your satellite uh, receiver, and we'll give you a new interface on top of that. We'll let you Skype chat to your buddy while the game's going. We're going to give you all these like on top of layered experiences smashed right on top of what is already wired stuff. So there's nothing about, I think, about the Microsoft Xbox One's uh, sale to me that's telling me, hey, this is the cord cutter box to get, nor do I think it is it will remain the cord cutter dr gateway drug because, again, they're trying so hard to make it this new layer on top of your existing box. And I think it's two very different approaches uh, to, to that whole idea. I think the study shows a maturity when it comes to the content that's available on these boxes, the Roku or Apple TV or any of the video game consoles. The thing was you tried to do this a couple of years ago and you tried to do this one-to-one -one thing of like, I watch these five shows can I get them available somewhere else? And can I find it on the box I want to use it on? And now we've seen a lot of different things. A lot of different movies are available. A lot of different television shows. They're available the day after. So you can actually do the math and go, wait a second. I don't need to have a $70 a month cable package if I'm only watching three shows. If they can figure it out how to use these things. Like Apple TV and Roku, I think, compared to the video game consoles, they have the simplest interfaces you can get when it comes to finding content that you want. They have a very... Well, Apple TV does one way with that really limited selection. Roku gives you tons of options. So then you find out you can pretty much watch 
what you want to watch or in a different style. The thing is, even all the uh, the major sports networks, the sports, uh, well, not companies, what would you call them? Associations, MLB, NFL, uh, NHL, leagues, thank you. All of those places, <laughs> associations, uh, federations of sorts. Well, the those, National Basketball Association is. These, these I, places that do sure. the sports, you know, the sports people. They usually have an online component, so you can cut the cord, and now you can. But years ago, you tried to do this like five or ten years ago, you'd be like, I can't watch half the stuff I want to watch because everybody was fighting. All right, let's take a quick break and thank our other sponsor for today's show. I think it's our only sponsor. That, that we don't need any more. We love Shutterstock. Well, the other sponsor is me. It's me and, and Shutterstock. I tell you what, you know, a while ago, me and Shutterstock were talking. Yeah. And uh, Shutterstock was like, hey, you know what we're really good at is providing high quality stock photos. I said, you know what I'm good at? Barking on the internet. And they said, yeah. well, why don't the two of us sponsor a show called Frame Rate? You'll bark on the internet. Hopefully, maybe someday become co host of this thing. Still crossing figures on that one. And we will sponsor the show and keep it financially afloat by as long as you put out the message of how great our product is. Wow. It, it actually, it's worked because I use Shutterstock every week. All what? the time. Yeah. I use, it, I use it for images. But did you know, did you know you could use it for footage, for video too? They have high well, quality stock video clips. I've heard that, and I've heard they added an extraordinary number of new clips every single day. How many? 10,000 clips each week. It's a big, 10, it's a big number. 1.2 million of the best royalty-free stock videos available right now at Shutterstock.com. You can, you can share them in clip boxes. You can save assets to the clip box and then invite other people like, hey, are these the right clips? And they're like, those are awesome clips. The, man, those are the best clips ever. And then you're like, well, man, our documentary or our feature film is going to be amazing. Or maybe it's just an instructional film for your HR department. But it'll be amazing because you're using good clips. And you can choose. You can buy individual clips. You can buy video packs if you're going to use a bunch of them. Download the clips in HD or standard def, whatever you need. And it's a complete global offering. Try Shutterstock today. Sign up for a free account. You don't need to give them a credit card. Start an account. Begin using the Shutterstock. Imagine what your next project could be like. Save the video selections you find in your clip box. And once you decide to purchase, what should they do? Brian, I mean, I kind of want to give them a discount because we got two well, sponsors packed into one here. I mean, okay. I'll, I'll tell you what. Uh, the original plan was you get no discount, but I get a fat kickback. I will yeah, give up my kickback right? starting now. I'll tell you what, this is from me personally. Brian Brushwood is doing this 30% off all new Whoa. accounts if you use promo code FRAMERATE8. And normally I wouldn't do this. I'm normally very selfish, but I feel very good about Shutterstock. I wanted to make this happen. Dude, you're a saint. Frame rate 8 for 30% off new accounts. You heard him. And we thank Shutterstock for their support of Frame Rate. Now it's time for a little segment on the show, Brian, we call Slipstream. Huh. I, I apologize on this, Tom. Uh, this is all very new to me. I understand you have a, a sure, set sure, rhythm. Slipstream is, uh, is what, what, that's a nonsense word. What does that mean? Oh, well, <laughs> it, it means we slip you information about the streaming services that provide the video you like to watch. Oh, does great. Okay, now? so this, this is, yeah, no, sure. Together. These about the providers. Yeah. Okay, got it. What yeah. stories do we have? Uh, the first one actually comes from a visitor, a uh, visitor, a listener, Terry Wagner. Uh, he said he sent us a story about East Link in Canada. In Halifax, they've decided to get rid of all their digital tiers. You still have to pay for a bundle on the basic tier, which are like the stuff they're legally required to carry. And then all the high value, like TSN is their sports network. All the big names that are on the basic. But if you want to get the digital tiers, you don't have to buy the theme packs anymore. They're still going to sell them if you want. But let's say you just like, no, I just want the NHL network. They're like, great, we'll sell it to you for three bucks. So is this the demise of those theme packs? Is this the beginning of a la carte? Do you believe it's the somebody, hype? Or? It's somebody trying it. It's a smaller cable company, grant you. But it's the first one in North America that I've heard give it a shot. Yeah, yeah, I'm down for it. I don't know. That's fine. It, you know what? Every time I hear about a little one like this, like a little stab at it, I get I, and that makes me happy. That means we're it means progress. But the smaller it is, the least the less I think it's gonna the work. There are so many. There are powers at play here, gentlemen, that we cannot contain. Yeah, but this sounds and, like something Dish would try, right? That's the thing. Yeah. So we'll see. Okay, let's see if Eastland collapses completely, and then if it doesn't, Dish might go. Wait a second, we're crazy. We'll do it too. 
Well, I, I'd be interested to see if anybody else imitates it. Uh, let's let's talk about something you can get domestically here in the United States, Aereo. Uh, it's it's an affordable way to get over-the-air broadcast cheaply over the Internet. And Aereo's CEO is saying, hey, guess what? You know what? We don't even have to get that many subscribers because all the broadcast networks are going after him saying, you need to pay us to carry these channels. And they're like, look, it's free. It's over the Internet. We give an antenna to somebody. We stream it. It's like a sling box. You can't stop us. And they said, you know, we only need a couple hundred thousand people really to make make money. The more we get, I can, the better I can it gets. hear all of the cable companies howling at this. Oh, they're, it's a they're jab. Sitting, they're it's shouting jab. Yeah, they're, they're saying, of course you don't need a million users. You're stealing our content. <laughs> what? You don't pay any retransmission fees. Yeah. Well, I was supposed Scott to Scott Johnson, come to you this. got Aereo in Salt Lake City today. Yeah. Yeah. I was supposed to, I was actually supposed to show up to this episode today. One of the reasons that you even asked me to come on there was to, A, to help get Brushwood in, kind of give him some training and help him, but also. Uh, because they, I was supposed to have it by now, and there was some confusion about how widespread and how far from the core city of Salt Lake City would it reach outward, specifically southwest to me, which is about 30 minutes southwest of the city. And uh, I don't have it yet. They say it's on its way. We're going to have it real soon. But I have friends, specifically one uh, big friend in Salt Lake City, who got it. She loves it. Uh, she says it works exactly as advertised, and they're going to totally use it and keep their subscription. And for eight bucks, she says it's a total steal. So... Uh, the good reports from various people around here who have already gotten it, no problems to speak of, no weird launch glitches or issues. Um, she's actually had it for a few days, so technically the official launch is today, but they've had it for a little while. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'm, I'm hopeful it'll, it'll you know spread around. I still that's one of those things I get real nervous about because I don't know how I've, Brian just did a little pantomime there that I think is that holds true. I don't know how there aren't bigger lawsuits with smarter lawyers and with worse litigation to the point that somebody starts losing so much money that they give up and say uncle. And I'm worried about that, but I am going to try it. So we'll see. Yeah. So there's that. Yeah. And I don't know if Tom's with us now. So maybe oh, I'm I'll with just, it. Don't look. Okay. Don't look. Don't look at him. Because I want you all, I want you all to show with your mouths, how excited you are about Barnes and Noble providing their own video streaming service on iOS and Android. Uh, well, you know, you know, my rule on this is is the more competitors, the better. The more blood that is shed in this revolution, the happier Brian is. So thank And I'll tell you what, we can all roll our eyes at Barnes and Noble being a late entry in this very crowded marketplace. We could talk about the dominant position that Amazon has and how Netflix is poised to crush them. The fact is, Barnes and Noble was late to the uh, ebook revolution as well. But the Nook is a player and the Nook provides um, a substantial benefit to consumers, uh, if not with the actual device itself, then at least with the pressures that having and that Barnes additional Noble's device. decided to stop making the Nook, so it's obviously a huge success for them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wait, did they? The, did, wait, when did this nook. happen? When did they stop it, uh, making the June. Nook? In June, June, they said, by the end of the year, we're not going to be making the Nook anymore. Yeah. All right, screw which, you, Bards and Noble. I hated you and I never bad. loved you. I actually really like the cheap end Nook, the like the cheap little, you know, e-ink version of the of the thing. I went and bought it specifically because they had you could do open standard ebooks, and I was like, Yeah, open standards, man. And then when I heard they were getting out, I was sad. Is there anything special well, the Nook, about uh, the uh, Barnes and Noble uh, video app? Is it is it just locked down to Barnes and Noble Nook again? Like I mean I know, I know it runs on iPads and and other tablets and Android. I I'm confused of it, do you still have to buy within the Nook universe? Well, yeah. Then this sucks. <laughs> Who cares? I mean, it's ultraviolet compatible. Well, so you okay. Can, you, can, you know, see, there's a little bit of wiggle room there. But why, you know, Voodoo doesn't let you buy in the iTunes universe. Why would Barnes & Noble? Well, that's why I'm like, should I be excited about this? I'm like, I don't think so. Why would so. Barnes & Noble let you buy from somebody else? They wouldn't because they money. need a strategy of some kind. But, like, but, maybe but they again, do something none crazy. Of this, Waiting. None of, this, uh, none of this in any way invalidates my point. My point was that, uh, that at the very least... Even if all it does is serve as another uh, force to put pressure on the bigger players, then it's still good. So I, for one, welcome our new uh, Nook chicken craps Over overlords. Right. Yes. Plus, they have, this, really. they have this direct connection with real live fleshy people. They don't have strictly online presence while well, like everybody else does. So they've got foot traffic. They got people coming in. They're going, I don't know what from this. And they'll say, well, this right here will do all those things for you. Really? Well, my grandson I says I should get an iPad. Don't listen to your grandson. This thing does all that stuff and more, even though we're discontinuing at the end of the year or whatever. They don't. They get. They get a decent chunk of business. It may not be enough for them to sustain it, but it's enough to, like you said, provide market pressure. That's a good thing for everybody. 
Can't watch yeah. a video on an e-ink nook. But they're still going to make the e-ink nooks. They're just launching a video app. I yep. don't know. Let's move on to tube tops. <laughs> Hey, you know what that gateway drug is? Uh, it, it's the Roku, actually. If you want to, if you want to talk to uh, Parks Associates, they found that 37 percent of broadband households with streaming media devices use a Roku. Only 24 percent use an Apple TV. Huh. This, uh, I totally believe this. And uh, you know, uh, Scott was talking about the flesh and bones connection that you have with Barnes and Noble people at the store. Uh, my parents-in-law bought a Nook. And I'm sure it was because they went to a physical Barnes and Noble and got talked into it. However, when they decided to get a streamer, my parents-in-law bought a Roku. So it's like you know they're very traditional folks, and so uh, the fact that they, that they bought that they went with a Roku, I was impressed. I don't know how they heard of it or what got them into it, but uh, it's clear that Roku really has this this um, Middle America blue color uh, appeal. That uh, that people are getting into. Well, they also have well, a price appeal. I mean, it is substantially cheaper. It's a big chunk of change. Different. Not cheaper than an Apple TV. TV. Well, well, I guess some of them are. So you're right. Some of them are. The entry level thing is going to get you in there for what? Fifty nine? Isn't that their price right 49 now? Forty nine now. Yeah, Forty nine. And you don't so have that's... to use an Apple device to use it. Yeah, and you've got. We're like, well, this does Netflix. Yeah, this has Hulu Plus app. Yeah, it's got all these apps. So it is a really. Uh, I think it's a price thing. It's the reason why I think the the Google. Uh, uh, the Chromecast is still a viable thing. It's almost disposable at the price that they're selling it for. And the Roku's in a similar boat. So, yeah, if you ask my grandpa, who's not with us anymore, but if he was, if he said, hey, which streaming device is he going to get? He goes, well, which one's 50 bucks less is what he'd say. <laughs> and that's, that's what he'd buy. Put it. So it's great. As much as I love the interface on the Apple TV, and I really do, um, you're paying that Apple premium for, that you do for certain products from Apple. And in that particular case, it hurts Apple a lot, I think. I think they lose out on a big piece of this market. Now, Apple, we think, is going to make an actual television or a big-time television service that's bigger than the Apple TV device we're talking about right now. They recently bought Matcha.tv, which had closed its doors in May. Now we think we know why, because it looks like they got bought by Apple. When it stopped doing business, it included TV listings of what's on cable, satellite, and cues for online streaming from services like Netflix and Hulu is attempting to be that one interface. Does this lend credence to the Apple service launching anytime sooner? I mean, I'm kind of over the whole Apple TV rumor at this point. It's like, you guys will either do it or not, but I'm done dancing around acting like I'm excited about it either way. Um, I've not used the Matcha interface, so I don't... Uh, in, interface. I said, that's I-N-N-A face. Matcha is, is how I spell it. The yeah. Matcha yeah. interface. Right. Uh, but, um, uh, to be honest, it's like, it's all, I'm so, I'm so on guard with Apple TV rumors now that I kind of don't even care. I'm like, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. Why don't you guys shut up until something happens for reals? Okay. Yeah. It's not, it. I'm not even irritated. I'm not irritated with Apple. I mean, they haven't, they don't say anything about it. It's just the rumors about Apple TV are, are kind of incessant and terrible and stupid and they should stop because who cares <laughs> until they do it. It's not going to matter anyway. And every time we get rumors and every time, you know, September, uh, Tim Cook gets on stage and announces a bunch of stuff. And the Apple TV's not in there again. It's like, all right, well, let's, how many times can you cry wolf? And when the wolf gets here, it's not going to kill anybody. We can just either buy it or not. That's why Apple TV is just a hobby. That's why they're probably not mad that Roku's got 30 whatever percent and Apple's only got 24 percent. It's just a hobby. The thing is, if you can find it's this discovery aspect to me, again, is the big deal. If you can have... All of these crazy apps that, you know, HBO Go app, and you got Watch ESPN, and this, 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 and this. If you can find it, that's the key, right? Roku's got a good search. If Apple has a good search, because Matcha used to have a uh, universal queue. So if you can just queue them up one after another, and you're like, you don't care what service it's on, that's a really big hook if this device ever comes out, or if they update the Apple TV, that little hockey puck. If you're excited about bringing an NFL Sunday ticket to your PS3 again this year, stop being excited because you can't. IDG con or I IGN confirmed it. They asked PlayStation reps and they said, nope, we are not allowed to do NFL Sunday ticket on the PS3. Uh, you Man. will still be able to do the, the independent like desktop app uh, that we talked about last week if you buy Madden. But DirecTV will be the only place to get the full on M NFL Sunday ticket. Sorry, I asked. Yeah. I, I, I don't know how to feel about this, you know, because it's like, uh, I, I don't know if it means, like, does it mean they tried online distribution, they didn't like it, and now it's not going to happen? Or does it mean that they're holding off for a better exclusive with someone else? Like, I, I honestly have no read on this whatsoever. No, DirecTV's contract NFL. ends in 2015. This so is just DirecTV's going do, out right? a couple more years. 
This is just doing what they do. They, the NFL is notorious for making contracts and having them be very exclusionary. There's nobody else is going to get this until they decide not to give it to Microsoft anymore. Whoever they gave it, it to right Sony now. for the past two seasons. They did. You're right. But I think that they have got some serious lockdown stuff going on with the one. It's one of their trump cards this this coming console season. So I don't think I, I think that they've locked that down good and hard. It's the same kind of deal they made with EA. They're like, well, EA, you give us enough money, then we'll not let anybody have the NFL license for here until forever. If you'll go ahead and give us enough money. And they did. And they pulled that license from everybody else. NFL, NFL 2K series went away, uh, which was arguably the better series at the time. Um, I don't know if you guys remember, that was a huge mess. And so now you've got this exclusive deal with EA. You only get Madden NFL. And that inherently means the market can't compete, at least with that with that game. In this particular case, this is more an issue of if Microsoft's willing to pay enough money to have exclusive rights to that, along with whoever else they already have contracted and block somebody else out, NFL will take their money. They're happy to do it. The NFL is really exclusionary in general, like, like Scott was saying. But like, I guess I was shocked at all that the NFL let their stuff show up on PlayStation. So the fact that it's gone, I was like, oh, I was surprised it happened. Now it's gone. Not too surprising because they, they have like very limited clips when it comes to other websites. You want to go to ESPN and watch an NFL clip? Forget it. you got to go to NFL.com and use their crappy player and their, their awful uh, video uh, quality. At least it was the last, last season. So it's just, it's just NFL. They're, they're the biggest sport in the country, so they get to do that. Yep. I, I, think it, I think it's much more interesting to think about the fact that DirecTV has their contract up 2015. This is, they're going in the last couple of years. They're starting to realize the importance of these online streaming, and they're saying we want control of that because if we're going to have any shot of keeping this, we have to make as much money off it as possible right now and get people using us. And I think it has less to do with the NFL and their exclusionary practices and more to do with DirecTV and what DirecTV will allow the NFL to do with it. Let's move on to film film. Oh no, J.J. Abrams has a new trailer and watch closely, friends, because there is not a single lens flare in it. Is it really <laughs> from J.J. Abrams? Let's watch, watch this whole thing. I like this. He arrived knowing nothing of himself. Who is he? Soon he will know. Because what begins at the water shall end there. Sounds like a financial. And what ends there shall once more begin. <laughs> you don't trust Prudential. This is what happens. Men become lost. Men Make a plan for your future. <laughs> With TD what are erased. And reborn. Our brokers won't give you mouth. Of you know who that so. is? That voice? That's, um, uh, that's. Oh, thank you. That's, the that is. <laughs> There's uh, the God. lens flare. Hold on. Who is that? That's what's his name from Frost Nixon. In case Nixon. you're confused, Jason put the lens flare in. That was not there. At the it's end. the guy it's, from it's Frost true. Nixon. Help me. Help me. Who is he? Who is he? Nixon. Who's the Frank Langella, dude? That's who that was, that voice. I bet you money. Any guesses of uh, what this is about? TV show? Web series? I, the the second no the second I saw it 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 looked like uh like a, a gritty Aquaman thing and Aquaman's that one of the, you know it's like it was a joke in <laughs> because uh, it's got water. Water entourage <laughs> yeah no, it's dude water. coming out of the water doesn't know who he is that'd be I'd watch a Aquaman movie that starts like that why not oh, apparently wow. apparently Bad Robot just acquired the last script Rod Serling ever wrote and there's a lot of speculation this could be a teaser for that hmm well it's got Frank Langella talking so I'm in. <laughs> That's all it takes. Yep, Why not? I'm in. I like that guy. Algeria promising in-depth news with its new U.S. cable network, which launches tomorrow from where we're recording the show. August 20th will be the day it launches in the U.S. It will launch on the channel that has been occupied by Current TV. They bought Current TV's slot and get that 50 million distribution. It's not on cable vision. It's not on Time Warner Cable, but it's on a lot of stations here. And they're not going to stream the English version of Al Jazeera anymore in the States because they want you to watch TV. Dumb move? That, this is a, well, it's bad for us. This is a step backwards in the cord cutting world. And it's a real bummer because Al Jazeera, you know, seems to be savvy enough to know. I mean, the problem is they, they spent the money to acquire this uh, cable network space. And once you've done it, you just, you have to 
you made your call and you need to you need to go all in on that and you need to undo some of the smarter things that you did which is a real bummer yeah i'm i'm having can i say one more thing about jj abrams i just had a thought maybe that was the star wars teaser maybe that was luke skywalker and his new story as he comes stumbling out of the ocean uh, other people the, have put that <laughs> forth as well in all seriousness yeah I, d I doubt it has anything to do with it but um now this is interesting and brian's right it's kind of like going I don't know what's it. It would be like buying the last, you know, a giant plant that does nothing, nothing but make gas combustion engines the day before somebody figures out a way to run cars on water. You kind of have to you you've made your investment. You either are just going to tank and ride it off or you're going to have to figure out a way to push through it or convert it or turn it or something. And, and that's kind of the boat they're in. Yeah. Speechless again. Speechless. I, I don't know. Ability. I was making all of his comments in the chat room instead of speaking. Oh. speaking. I'm, yeah, well, I'm, I'm still <laughs> thinking about Aquaman or if it's Why the Last Man or something strange. Uh, yeah, that, I guess the trailer is more interesting to me than the Al Jazeera switch. Sorry. What about Microsoft remaking Blake 7 for the Xbox? They were supposed to have it for sci fi. Does that excite you, Ayaz? Uh, you want to fill me in what Blake 7 is? <laughs> ah! <laughs> Uh, Classic Blake sci-fi TV series. Uh, Blake Seven to me was always the show that was on after Doctor Who on PBS when I was a kid, and it's the one that my dad would watch, but I would. Oh, never that watch. one? No, not excited. <laughs> Sorry. You can send all hate mail to is at twit.tv. I'm excited, but not about Microsoft getting it. I would rather see. I don't know why that bothers me. It shouldn't bother me, I suppose. I like if you told me three years ago that Netflix was going to do it, I'd say, "Oh, don't do that. That sounds terrible." But today, I'd say that'd be all right. Ten years ago, I would have said, if you said cable's doing it, I would have said, don't have cable do anything new. Now I'd say, please let cable do it. So maybe it could change my mind. But I, I, Microsoft is unproven yet with this whole, this new spin, this original Halo series they're working on. Uh, that one, I forgot the other game that's tied into that live action show they're going to do on the Xbox. But those things are unproven. When they come out with those, let's see how they do. Let's see how strong they come out of the gate. And then if stuff's strong and it looks good and not cheap and terrible, then, then maybe I'm back in. All right, it's time for a segment called Scan Lines. Uh, Brian, let me explain this to you. What we do is mm. I'll, I'll set up a, uh, a segment with, like, this is what it's about. This is a story, and you have 60 seconds to discuss it. Okay, you I'll can... tell you what. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, well, I was going to say this sounds like a lot of fun, a new idea. Uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to have a one-minute extension if a story is particularly interesting. I was about to but... say you are. Allowed oh well, good. That's very that's very convenient. Uh, I'll tell you what. Let's just let's get this thing started, and I'll take the first story. <laughs> Go for it, man. Do it. <laughs> Randy like Moore's do Escape from Tomorrow, shot in Disney theme parks without Disney's permission, is going to see the light of day. It's actually going to get a theatrical release October 11th, and uh, of course, video on demand as well. Uh, the whole thing with this story was that um, they they essentially did a heist, a real life heist where they took uh, consumer-grade DSLRs, they went out, they, they, they made these scenes, they coordinated so they didn't group in one area too much so that uh, park officials figured out they were secretly making a movie. The question is, is Disney going to go ape nuts about this? Are they going to freak out and sue them? And would that be good or bad for the movie, Tom? Yeah, they, no, they're not going to get sued if they're careful. I don't think they have any intellectual property in there. They just shot on the site. So, I mean, I don't think it's Disney's... It's not worth Disney protecting their trademark because there's no trademark protection. And otherwise, they just give themselves a bad name. What about well, people? And, uh, can I throw this in? What about people that yeah, do extension? The, the extension. People that I'm are using there. my extension. Yeah, but they have, do they all have to have sign waivers? All the people, all the fat people in line and stuff. <laughs> They're in public. They're out of focus. Okay. They're in the background. Okay. <laughs> Well, and, and to be honest, and this is really remarkable. You see some of the shots they got look like jib shots. Uh, you know, we don't know. I'm sure there'll be a fascinating behind the scenes making of for this. But uh, number one, it would be a bad play for Disney to get all bent out of shape about this because they would have to assert the case that they own, uh, you know, the physical location. I mean, it's it would be really difficult for them to win for one. And number two, it would just create a bunch of publicity for this very unreal story. Uh, the smartest move for Disney to shut the hell up and let it happen. Brilliant move on the part of the people who made the, this movie. And weirdly, I, I'm, I'm so thrilled this happened because there exists a place called Disneyland. And, the, and people go to this and have things happen to them. And I'm glad to see a movie that is based in weirdly more reality because it gave the finger to intellectual property. Or did it? I don't think it did. I think it's entirely fair use. 
Martin Scorsese's World Cinema Foundation, in a partnership with the Criterion Collection, is bringing eight of the first 21 movies that the organization has preserved to Hulu. The movies will be free for streaming with commercials until August 24th, then only on Hulu Plus, but without ads. Hey, it makes sense. Uh, this makes sense that he would uh, go to this location. I, I wish I knew what the movies were or why I should the care about them. Korea will be the first one. Then Senegal's Tuki Buki, Turkey's Law of the Border and Dry Summer, Morocco's Trances, India and Bangladesh's A River Called Titus, and Kazakhstan's Revenge and Mexico's Redes. I swear to God, Tom, if that phrase that you just spoke were on a loop, I would listen to it in my earbuds <laughs> at all times. And the world would be just a little more surreal for it. <laughs> I dare you to make less sense. That's those are amazing titles. Uh, yeah. Okay. Good. Old movies. I'll check them out. Done. <laughs> Wait. Yeah. Got three seconds. <laughs> Sen Senegal's Turkey Burkey. I just want to see whatever the hell that is. I want to see that movie. <laughs> Swedish TV provider Comhem gave out 20 Samsung built boxes that run TiVo and access IPTV. Customers are asked to document their experience. The boxes have normal TiVo features like TiVo to go and simultaneous DVR recording of up to three HD channels. But the big twist is that it's, uh, you know, it's all IPTV. Um, man, oh man, do I love me some TiVo. I love their interface. I still regret my, my years spent with my stupid Time Warner DVR. Uh, I, I'm anything new TiVo is doing. I'm in on. I what think I, this uh, is the, the world of the future, right? Where it's like, Hey, I can use something awesome like TiVo and just get my TV over the internet. Perfect. But it brings us back to that whole Sony question. Yeah, I'll kick it over to the other guests. I asked, Scott, you got anything on this? Well, I mean, uh, the TiVo interface, if it's the latest one, it'll be all right. But I remember their VOD service being a mess. So if, if it works really well, all right. But I don't know how their VOD is nowadays. <clears throat> remember when the sound, boop, 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 that sound was like synonymous and cool? Let's, let's bring it back, baby. Let's make that the That's same. Google saying. Fiber Android app got an update today that adds support for Vudu, adding another over-the-top video service along with Netflix and, of course, YouTube. This will allow viewers to search for and view content across their TV and mobile screens, including all of those services. So whether it's on the Google Fiber cable service or whether it's on Vudu, customers will have to log into Vudu on each box, though. Am I a bad person that I've never used Vudu for anything? I haven't downloaded. I haven't bought anything yes. on Vudu. Yes, you're a horrible person. person. Terrible, terrible, person. terrible man. Is it, is it good? Is it really good? It is. I've, I forced myself to try it recently, and I'm starting to really like it because of the flexibility it gives me. I can watch it on every screen. And, and uh, all my ultraviolet stuff goes in there automatically. Stuff I got through Flickster and with Blu-rays all shows up in Vudu. Wait a minute. Mr. Mr. Anti-DRM is using Vudu regularly and enjoying it. Is it because the DRM doesn't suck this time? Because it actually uh, works? DRM sometimes sucks, but what video service can I use without DRM? I, as I will go use it. I don't have one. Yeah, take that from Mr. DRM. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I buy all my clothes from Mr. DRM. Uh, Zachary right. Seward over at uh, The Atlantic has an article documenting AMC's history and how they're bucking the trends. Talks a lot about um, uh, the, the way they created Breaking Bad, the way they invested in stories that... Uh, were unconventional, that would be highly regarded, that would be infectious, that people would want to tell other people. Uh, new episodes available on iTunes and Amazon a few hours after airing. Netflix has the rights to stream all previous episodes, which has increased the viewership. They also struck a deal with Netflix UK to get episodes as quickly as, as they can after they air in the U.S. Does this make AMC more amenable to Google, Sony, Apple, etc.? Tom? No. I don't. I don't think it does. I think they still want. They're just as greedy as Viacom. They they want to get paid. That's where they're making all their money is on subs. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And if you look, uh, they're making uh, actually they're making their money. You know, on those um uh, those fees, the fees. They're getting the fees. It's the bees yeah. knees. Those fees. <laughs> sci-fi iPhone app becomes sci-fi now. Streaming full episodes to the app for subscribers of select providers, not DirecTV, Time Warner, Cable, or Comcast, by the way. Uh, Sci-Fi's iPad app becomes Sci-Fi Sync, which is their second screen thing you're supposed to use while you watch the shows. Coming to Android in September. This, uh, yeah, I haven't played with any of these. The services themselves may suck, but uh, but this is the right idea. Uh, all channels should have an app that lets you access all the content as if you were on that channel and you should be able to do it, you know, whenever you want. And you should be able to switch over to live on the app eventually, which who knows what may happen. Uh, and 
I think services should offer a second screen experience. I think the sci-fi sync is a good idea. Uh, and oh, really? I, think I think it's stupid. Well, I, I think it's good branding. I, I think that um, you want to at least have that supplementary stuff available. Are you telling me you wouldn't do a Breaking Nobody Bad? Nobody uses second, second screen, screen experience? apps. No, never you, wouldn't do. Do it during, you wouldn't do it during Breaking Bad, like last night when we were watching. I didn't. When you watched the second time. They have wouldn't. a second screen app. Okay. <laughs> well, that's true. <cool. laughs> Let's move on to check out how Brian is killing everyone in the summer. <laughs> So that's that's the criteria, Tom. Right? Is uh, whoever wins the movie draft gets to be the co-host. Is that is that yes, correct? Yes, exactly. That's how it works. <laughs> Looking good for me. The world's end hasn't Holy even come crap. out. I'm at nine hundred and seventy million dollars. I'm going to be a billion dollar baby by next week. You can week. basically just give two hundred million dollars, like to Scott right now, and yeah. you'll be fine and still be you the still winner. Win. And I think yeah. you should. Yeah, I'm actually, t- it's that's pathetic. maybe. We- Maybe we could add that rule where it's like you could give your money to someone. Just, I guess you guys could all pool together and make Justin win. <laughs> That's true. He's the only one that we could. But holy yes, crap. You, Brian. I don't know. Do you, can I ask? I want to ask this a question. I want to ask the, the clear winner here. Did you know? Did you tell me the truth? Did you know when you had your list of movies that you had the win this year? Did you feel no. it? Okay. All right. I, I had I had the vague feeling that I did well. Uh, and, and to be honest, this is not this this summer's game is not a game of winners. It's a game of people who bought, uh, you know, uh, duds that exploded. You remember at the end of at the beginning of this summer, Steven Spielberg and George Lucas were talking about like we're anticipating a, a cratering in of a bunch of blockbusters just crap in the bed. And I think this was the summer. I think I think it happened instantly. I think we had a bunch of big budget movies that totally underperformed. Unfortunately, most of them bought by Scott Johnson. No. <laughs> Don't remind. Oh, don't. Planes sucked. Just yeah. utterly, royally sucked. I, I knew after Earth I had overpaid for it when I bought it. But Planes, I thought I'd, I'm like, oh, yeah, I didn't pay that much for it. It should, oh, it just did not, did not pay off. Well, yeah. and it was weird, too, because it, it shows you how savvy. I don't know if they just underpromoted it or if uh, you have more savvy consumers now because they tried their damnedest to act as though Planes was a sequel to Cars or to indicate that Planes maybe came from Pixar, which it, of course, totally did not. Uh, but but nobody bought it. Nobody nobody fell for it. Or maybe they it did. Was, That's why. Have you seen Cars 2? That could be a reason. If you connected to Cars, that, that was a You're real totally right. piece of... My kid likes it. I, <laughs> that, I think that's it, the problem, right? Kids love yeah. it, that, and it, so it worked in that way. But um, I, there have got to be people who, at Pixar... Without their own control, feel dirty about the way planes was Ugh. was promoted because they know they didn't make it. There are people there that aren't happy with the way cars went and don't like that inanimate objects with eyeballs is now the hot new business and that they're somewhat responsible for that and that it isn't the quality's not great and that some of their core fans are upset. So the way that that was marketed, there are there are got to be people at Pixar that are just like, damn it, why? why oh my god, we, I would I would be pissed uh, because yeah. I mean, say what you will about the second cars, but the first cars, uh, yes, it's Doc Hollywood. But, uh, man, I loved it. I love the first car, Cars movie. The World's uh, End it, premieres this week, and it's Brian's movie. So it's all over, folks. Give him, give him your G, 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 polite applause. Uh, you know what? I think it's also all over for the chat realm for, uh, players as well. Let me see if uh, how close it is on the chat realm side. Because last time I checked, uh, Jalen Jade was in first. Oh, he's been supplanted by Crew uh, SML. Looks like he's in first place. So we may have a single r- winner on the chat realm side of things. Funny thing is at at World's End is also, uh, at least at quick glance, one of the highest reviewed, uh, best reviewed, pre-reviewed movies of the year. So not only do you have that going for it, you have critical, you know, strong critical response. I think you have a lot of uh, core fans of what they've done in the past, their other movies. I feel like you're just, this is like insult to injury. You're literally opening my wound and you're you're putting like gas, gasoline on it. Did you notice, Scott? I was I was I was at uh, Tom Merritt's house yesterday because uh, I was vacation. Did you notice that? Yeah, yeah uh, I did notice that. No, did you notice? Like we were watching Breaking Bad and they were advertising uh, at World's End. They did that same beat where they talk about. Normally, it's all like you know, Houston Chronicles says this is amazing or whatever. Give the quotes. They didn't do a single reviewer quote. They only took quotes from other celebrities who create stuff like you know, uh, like Robert Downey Jr. and so on. I thought oh, that wow. I had never seen that before. I thought that was a really interesting move. 
Yeah. Wait, so did you guys watch Breaking Bad together? Maybe. Oh, that's that's hot. Quite possible. Dude. Yeah. yeah. Everything has first got on today. Good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's uh you know what, Jason? I think it's time for a little feedback. No? Now right. it's time for feedback <laughs> with Brian and Tom on Flame Radio. Yeah. You were five seconds shy of the actual time for feedback. You called. I guess that, no. That's that must be what it is. I apologize for that. <laughs> uh, first, Zach says Frame Rate is one of his top three shows. Thank you, Zach. We're number he three. We're number three. <laughs> <laughs> he said one of. We could be number one. We don't know. <laughs> we are potentially one, two, or three. Uh, he says, okay, I have a topic for you. Digital movie downloads. I'm one of those who have always purchased the DVD or Blu-ray, but now I'm thinking I want to transition to just keeping movies on an external hard drive. Where is the best place to buy a digital copy of a movie? Amazon says you need to download their app to play back. Google Plus is confusing and to if you can actually play it not on an Android device or move it to an SD card or external drive. I think it means Google Play. Uh, and most of us just want a digital copy I can play on any PC I plug my external drive into. Burning my original DVDs and movies is the other question. What's the easiest way to do it? Thanks for creating great content. I as you've done you've done a couple of episodes of know how about this sort of thing. Yeah, I'm laughing because if you think you're gonna buy you know buy all this content from one company and be able to play it back on everything, you're kind of nuts. Unless you're doing like a live uh, distro of, of Windows or something strange. Um, the 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 most like, like we were joking before about this, but the thing is, if it's got DRM on it and you have to have a companion app that can read it, that's going to limit what you can do with that hard drive of yours. So if they craziest way to do it is just to rip your own stuff uh, and that's somewhat legal somewhat illegal depending where you are yeah you can rip your own stuff with dvds if you're not circumventing the copyright protection mm -hmm. legal yeah there, and, and if you want to play in the drm universe ultraviolet is getting better it's still not perfect it's still kind of buggy but when you buy uh, a dvd that ha comes with the ultraviolet copy you can pay two dollars or actually when you buy it with the ultraviolet copy you get it mm -hmm. and it's available on flickster it's available on voodoo it'll be available on barnes and nobles app if you care about that stuff and then other dvds that you have you can pay two dollars you may not think that's fair but you can pay two dollars and then add it to your ultraviolet library and so you can get it in all of those different places but there really isn't one thing that makes it easy that's the whole problem with drm is there's nothing that allows you to actually take the movie you own and use it everywhere. Just carry a laptop with you with a giant hard drive and just have an HDMI cable with you. That'll do it. Yeah, and every, then every time. And rip off the, the restrictions. All right, well, speaking of, you mentioned the ultraviolet thing. We got this uh, email from Nikki in Omaha who says, I'm trying to figure out this ultraviolet thing. It seems very buggy. I have myself, my sister, my sister-in-law, my daughter, all with accounts. I've linked my Vudu, Flickster, and Cinema Now accounts just recently it seems that when movies I add and my sister has added aren't going into the system properly. Example, I added Oblivion though my Voodoo account, or through my Voodoo account, and it's not showing up at Ultraviolet at all. Also submitting movies through some other accounts on different computers are a nightmare. Do you think you could give a best practice of maybe what to do and what not to do? Personally, I think uh, linking any of these services to Facebook is a bad idea because I'm at my husband's computer, which is uh, it's painful to get into an account because I have to sign out of everything and sign back in. Thanks for any help. Uh, dude, I think this is... This is the exact consumer problem that that uh, ultraviolet is facing. There, there's no simple narrative. It doesn't work all the time. It, it's it's. I, I I don't know what to tell you. Unfortunately, Nikki, do you have well, anything this, on this, Tom? It's confusing. What what she's probably running into, and I didn't get a, a chance to check, is not every mo movie studio is part of ultraviolet. So not every movie you buy on Vudu comes with ultraviolet. Even the studios that are part of Ultraviolet haven't approved every movie they own to be part of Ultraviolet. So it's it's not a two-way street. It's not, oh, I buy it on Cinema Now, I can watch it on everything. I, or I buy it on Vudu, I can watch it on everything. It's it's piecemeal. And so it's confusing. You're like, wait a minute, but I bought this on Vudu. Oh, but that's not Ultraviolet. But I thought Vudu was part of Ultraviolet. Well, they are. But the things I bought on Flickster showed up. They can sometimes in certain cases. That's the problem with all of this stuff is it doesn't work the way people want it to. It doesn't work the way people expect it to. And they're going to get angry at it eventually. Ultraviolet may be the most flexible DRM system so far, but that doesn't mean it's going to meet consumer expectations when consumers really start to make it want to deliver on the promise of what it should do. Man, I, I uh, don't know if I... I, I we got one email of somebody who was very offended 
that you hurt TiVo owners' feelings. Uh, you want, oh, do you want to apologize to everyone who owns a TiVo? I do, actually. I said the device the old-fashioned can't let go of. I'm sorry, Matt. I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to insult you. Maybe that's overstating it. But my point was, and he, he said a lot about like, TiVo's the one device that lets me get all my shows and I don't have to know when an episode's airing. I don't even have to know what network it's on. I'm like, yes, that's true if it's airing on a cable network that you get within the two-week guide window that you can record it or is available as an on-demand thing that your TiVo can access. But what I want is the entire universe of all of the shows that have ever been created and are available to be able to just type in like, all right, I want to watch season four of all, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Where can I watch it? I want to watch the pilot episode of 10 Speed and Brown Shoe. Where can I find it? TiVo doesn't do that. And, and, exactly. and unfortunately for TiVo, the set-top boxes that used to entirely suck have caught up with them to not suck any more than is necessary to make you care, right? I don't long for the TiVo like I used to with DirecTV because the DirecTV DVR works fine. This right. is what I love about Tom. Every chance he gets for as long as I've known you, if you can get a 10 speed and brown shoe reference in, it's <laughs> awesome. So true. I love it, dude. Love it. Uh, hey, and I don't know when this happened, Tom. Tell me about this, uh, the Frame Rate Chicken Challenge Google Plus community. This is awesome. I started this last Monday because we were get. I was going through the, cause usually what people don't know is Brian usually goes through all the emails. Okay, we're taking off the shtick for a minute. Brian goes through all the emails and he's really great about answering people and saying thanks for emailing in and he picks all the stuff for the feedback. So with him out, I had to go through and do that and I was overwhelmed by the number of chicken challenge emails, which I know you are every week too, Brian. Like there's just sure. so many great stories. So I started a Google Plus community called Frame Rate Chicken Challenge for people to go and share their stories. And we've got people talking to each other, commenting on each other's things, learning like, oh, that worked for you with that system. That's interesting. So uh, we'll have a link to that in our show notes or just go to Google Plus and, and search Frame Rate Chicken Challenge and the community will show up and you can join it. Uh, just, just at 2.23 this afternoon, William Parks talked about Colin Verizon with the intent of canceling no matter what. And other than reminding me about the large cancellation fee, the guy was great. Thanks for the motivation to do this. It wasn't even a chicken challenge for him. He's like, no, just get rid of it. I'll pay the $210. I'm out. I, I, I'll tell you what. Uh, last night at our meetup in L.A., uh, Bob McBob came out and uh, uh, real name Stephen. Uh, and he told us his chicken challenge story. Essentially, he got a guy on the line where he was like, yeah, well, it's just so expensive. I don't want to pay so much. And the guy working the phone service queue was like, why don't you do what I do? Uh, just sign up for the service, watch the show, and then the next day cancel it. And as long as it's less than 24 hours, we're required to refund everything. And if we don't, and if, and if you're after two hours, then we prorate it. So you're only paying like, you know, a dollar for the one day that you had HBO. And he's just like, this is freaking amazing. So try that one too. That's amazing. Wow. We need to. We need a graph of how often these things work or something. Anyway, uh, that brings us to the end of an excellent episode of Frame Rate. If you're wondering about, uh, well, what about Breaking Bad? Are you guys going to talk about Breaking Bad? Yes, there will be a spoiler zone for Breaking Bad. First of all, big thanks to Scott Johnson. Even I know we were going to have you on to talk about Ario, and I'm sorry you were outside the service area. But thanks for, for coming and hanging out anyway. It was an absolute blast. Always fun to hang with you guys. And all kidding aside, it is great to see uh, Brian back. I know he was busy with top secret business, but it's nice to see him back where he should be holiday. in the proper co-hosting chair. I was just on a yeah, holiday. holiday. A guy holiday. can go to the Palmdale Desert and spend two days in the desert on holiday and then come home without the whole world freaking out, can't they? I know. Everyone's losing their crap over it, but I, for one, respect you for your choices. And uh, thanks for having me on, guys. It's been a blast. Uh, people should, if they had any interest in any dumb thing I said today, they can follow me on Twitter, at Scott Johnson. And uh, it's always fun to hang out with you guys. Even IAS. I like spending time with IAS, really. Thank you, Scott. You know, one of my favorite if, things. If you want to see some of the stupid things I say, follow me on Twitter and Scott Johnson, because usually we have the dumbest conversations together <laughs> on Twitter. So definitely do that, at IAS, and follow Scott Johnson. And be watch uh, Ayaz and I together every morning on Tech News Today. Oh, yeah. Check out Know How, Ayaz's how-to series that airs right here at twit.tv slash kh. And I'm serious. I'm serious, folks. I'm not kidding you. I want you all to do this right now if you are, are, haven't already. Go follow at Scott Johnson and at Ayaz, I-Y-A-Z. <laughs> you will not regret it. I'm serious. Do it. Yeah. We'll, yeah. we'll wait. We won't let Just you do down. We promise. No pressure, Ayaz. Now we have to talk more. That's easy. <laughs> One of us always says something stupid. It's, yeah. it's bound to happen. It's
It's like, yeah, it's like the sun coming up. You can pretty much count It's going it. to happen. Mm -hmm. all, ki all kidding aside, Brian Brushwood, I missed the crap out of you. I'm so glad you're back. Well, I wish you missed the rest of me, but I'm glad that at least some part of it was missed. Just, just take what you can get, Brian. You. I, cl I cleansed you is what I'm trying to say. Uh, thank you. Good. I hope you're feeling better now. Hey, uh, Thanks for watching, folks. Twit.tv slash FR is the URL to, to find all of our stuff online. You can email us. Uh, our email address is framerate at twit.tv. And you can find us live on the internet, live.twit.tv every Monday at 3.30 p.m. Pacific, 6.30 p.m. Eastern. We will see you on your big screen television when you watch us there. It was famous. G Breaking Bad is back and man am I happy. How are you first of all quality wise first two episodes scale of 1 to 10 where are you at? Uh, uh I am 9. And yeah. uh, only only not saying 10 because you just should never say 10 on principle. But but really I couldn't be happier with where they're going. I was a little concerned in episode 1 that we were going to have to string this out for a while and that final scene with Hank where he just is like, no, I'm not, I'm not hiding. I'm not pretending. I am going to punch you. I don't care if you have cancer. I am after you. I was just, I'm like, wow, we, it, it is on. And, is and not, everybody's scrambling. It is not at all what I had expected. What I expected was eight episodes of the, the noose tightening and the web closing in on him. And yeah. instead it's just like, yes, yes, you get it. He gets busted or somebody's out to get him. Uh, I think they came up with a very plausible reason for why Hank would not want to move immediately. Uh, the fact that, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a proud man and that he doesn't want to be a laughing stock. I mean, that's, that's through the entire series. For all of his bravado, Hank's deepest fear is being laughed at, uh, being mocked. And, uh, and so he doesn't want to screw this up. It gives a reason why he would hesitate. I'll tell you what, man, that scene where Marie lost the high ground by trying to take the kid, uh, being a dad, I was ready to deck your television and and grab that baby. I mean, it's like I couldn't. I it, it was it was difficult for me to sit through that scene. I wanted to hurt something. Well, and what was so realistic about that scene is that both Marie and Skyler are coming from the same motivation, right? Yeah, Skyler's is a little stronger because that's actually Skyler's child. But Marie has a, a huge attachment to that child, and Marie is doing it the same thing. Marie is like, "You cannot keep this child here. It is unsafe. I'm going to protect this baby." And Skyler's like, "You will not protect my baby. That's my baby." That right. and to think like that's just a side plot. That's yeah. well, and it's so powerful. That's how amazing the show is being so far. Okay, I got two things I want to address. First of all, uh, I'm so glad because at this point. I feel caught up. You know how it's like uh, you can kind of see certain things coming and you're just waiting for that moment to happen. All the moments that I was waiting for to have happen this season have now already happened. And from now, I have no idea where anything is headed from here. You know, we had the beat where Hank realizes we have, you know, his, his vendetta beginning. We have uh, we, we got a little more hints of, of the future collapse of, of what happens with with this whole setup. Um uh, I, I do feel like Lydia is just a weak. I, I don't know if the actress is weak or the character's weak, but like well, every time Lydia is comes intentionally in, weak. Right. But, or, but also you could be weak and be compelling. Hank is a weak character. His, his, his personality is weak, but he's super compelling. I, I want to see more Hank all the time. Very well acted. Whereas Lydia, I don't, I don't quite feel it. Um, you know, even like, you know, her acting during the coup, uh, with with the you know with the shots or whatever, but again, I don't know if that's the actress or the character. Uh, I think it's the character. I think maybe you just don't like the character because it doesn't bother me. I just look at it and go, yeah, that's who she is. She is the woman who never, who's always nervous, never shows her strength, so that you underestimate her. And it worked perfectly in the coup because they yeah. all see her and they're like, oh, you're the you're the lady, yeah, whatever, lady. We're not gonna, and no one suspected that that was coming from her. Yeah. And I think that's uh, the way she plays it on purpose. I'll tell you what, Todd is uh, is maybe the most interesting character in the show to me right now because this uh, like I picture Todd going home and writing goals, proper goals 
for becoming a, a, a drug lord kingpin. And uh, like he's got this kind of gee whiz 1950s attitude, uh, this can do hard work ethic. And oh, yeah, kills people, you know, like like uh, I love I, I wish we spent more time with Todd as a character. Um, oh, here's my question for you. I've it really hit me. And maybe it's just because I watched the two back to back. And I understand we're in the final arc. We've built up characters with a very interesting backstory. We've seen all these twists and turns. Uh, but man, oh, man, did it strike me how different Breaking Bad is now from where it started. When it first started, you had beats about the uh, the mechanics of cooking meth. You you saw a lot of the reality of meth users, of selling and buying meth. You know, there was a, a heavy focus on that, that prostitute chick who, uh, you, you know, you got her story. In some ways, you almost felt like you were watching a documentary that was giving you the inside sauce to a very dark underworld. That is not the show we're watching now. We are now watching an over-the-top soap opera. Now, having said that, I'm enjoying it, and I love it, but we have cartoon characters in an epic face-off. It's the Godfather now, as as I as disagree I think with you the said cartoon yesterday. character statement. Oh, I don't think really? cartoon you don't feel like it's no. over-the-top? We got, we got people who've been shot and run over with cars who are now walking around and, uh, you know, magic meth dealers and, and, and snacks coups at the snap of a finger it's 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 now the godfather this is the godfather yeah but these i i, I get what you're saying i just i i reacted to cartoon characters because the cartoon characters implies shallow with with no. unbelievable motivation and but, these okay, are they're, far they're from superheroes. that heroes i i mean i mean they're superheroes they are superhuman individuals all of these people you know and it started with gus there Bring are definitely and his super aspects of them you're right like who would but at the same time, it's just on the edge of believability. Maybe across the edge of believability, but it's yeah, not. I think it's crossed for me. I think it's crossed. It, it hasn't crossed course. that far for me, though. I, I, this could all happen. There's nothing impossible in it. It's incredibly unlikely, sure. But, you know, yeah, it's not the wire. It's not like, oh, yeah, this is gritty. This is the way it goes down. I, it, it, it is not like that. So it is, there's some exaggeration to it. You're right. All right. Well, uh, let me. Uh, so, so what? What are your thoughts? I think that I they made a risky but excellent choice to say all the things you think are going to happen in the last episode, we're going to make happen in the first. We're going to just yes. we're going to start the chase. Let's get it on. We've given you the tease of of Walt with hair. So, chem, no chemo anymore in the future. That's right. We've now given you the tease of the house destroyed and. How did that go down? We've given you the tease, and maybe we should get into theories in a second, of Walt taking on the behavior of Skyler by arranging his bacon to his birth date number. And there's this theory that Walt always takes on the habits of the people that he kills. One aspect you see in these first two episodes is him laying the towel down before he kneels to vomit the way that well, Fring did. You also see him in the flash forward wearing what looks like Jesse Pinkman's coat. Jesse's the, coat. The Army Green exactly. uh, Army so Surplus see, coat. So even though it's like, wait a minute, they've spent the capital. Like he's been caught for all intents and purposes by Hank. Right. How are you going to get eight episodes out of this? Oh, you're going to. Because you have this mystery of like, how does it get to that part? And you don't have the... Sort of, yeah, it's dramatic tension, but it's so expected to be like, oh, we're going to play out this guessing game. We've been playing the guessing game for five five years. I am five and a half years, I guess. I am glad I'm, it's they just got rid of that in the first episode. I'm like, okay, let's just have a chase scene. Let's just have a seven-episode chase scene where they're trying to catch Walt. Is there any chance that they flip the switch? Uh, and the only reason I'm entertaining this, like... Tactically, what I'm about to propose makes no sense, and I would never run a show this way. But Breaking Bad has built an entire empire on doing the opposite of what you think they should do. Uh, what makes sense is to always keep the flash forward and have the very last episode reveal what happens in the the, the future fl flash forward moment. That makes me think that we're only going to get like one more episode in the past, and episode four of this mini season is going to be where we go real time from then on. Like I feel like, I, and I, I have no reason to back this up i have no uh, uh well, inside knowledge at all like, did episode I feel like two have a flashback in it yeah or was it episode, just episode one uh well this entire or i get at the beginning yeah episode one and two episode two had the bigger one episode two had the chick dropping the the the, the uh groceries with the oranges and then you no, saw that was episode her. one no that was episode 
two. Yeah, it was episode one because I I remembered knowing it was coming when you were watching it. Okay. End of last season had the uh, just the brief one at Denny's. Yes, uh, yeah, that's episode Patrick two Daylight didn't Hansen, have a flash way. forward. Thank you, Patrick. But but okay, episode two definitely did not have a flash forward at all. Ken from Chicago's backing me up, and I'm pretty sure it didn't. Had an old it man. Started, it started with the old man going to the following the picking up the money and then finding Pinkman, which is the scene that made me puke. All like right. Spinning on the merry go All right. Thing. All right. I, stay, I stand corrected, but I still feel like uh, they, they might do something nutty, like take us to that flash forward moment halfway through this mini season. Well, yeah. And they could. That, that is a great point because they could do a departure like that where we, we start to get more of that story earlier rather than having it at the very end. The way they normally do. I would I would love that sort of a, a dovetailing effect. Yeah. Uh, well, regardless, uh, it continues to be good. Uh, it's a different experience now than what it once was. Uh, we're, we're, we're in that we're in the fulfillment phase where we've gotten so many of the answers to the questions that we had early on. And, you know, now it's harder and it's more specific. We're in that God of the gaps area where to find more questions, they have to start feeding us more bizarre tidbits like, you know, is, is Pinkman going to get his act together? Uh, you know, what does this flash forward mean? Is Skyler going to betray him or, you know, does Hank catch him? Um, I love that with Hank knowing and having a modicum of evidence, Walt is still free. Like that is yeah. the, the, the blessedness of Walt's character is that he can always sidestep it through his own actions or not. Yeah. It's just, yeah. And there's, you know, and it's not a convoluted way. Like, you totally get why Hank doesn't want to go in with this evidence yet. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anyway, can't say enough good things. Still enjoying it very much. I will try not to say enough good things. Wait. I mean, you're right. Can't say enough good things. Uh, think it's Hamlet? Do you think it's a retelling of Hamlet now with Pinkman as Hamlet? No. That's one of those uh, crazy. It, well, um, uh, no, it's, it's so difficult because in this kind of production, there's so many things that can happen that have significant and maybe I, I, I'm going to say it wasn't intentionally written from the beginning to be Hamlet. No, sure. I'm pretty sure you're right about that. But they may they may be picking up the threads now going, you know what this is like? Yeah. Kind of like Hamlet. And then, uh, well, and also the problem is, is like you've got um, uh, you've got a costume designer who's not consulted on the story, who's not brought in on everything. This chick, whoever, you know, and I'm making this story up, so don't don't take it for anything. But but this chick is like, oh, you know what? It would be kind of cool if I went with a theme that matches Hamlet or whatever. And then it shows up. And then after the fact, somebody picks up on it and writes an article about it. Later, the uh, the, the folks in the writer's room who read the article about it be like, oh, somebody pointed out that we could, you know, we could run with that. What if we made that a story element or whatever? So it's like, it's like uh, we all want very badly to believe that these master craftsmen like an a J.J. Abrams or, or a Vince Gilligan begin with the end in mind and it's all fully formed in their head. I mean, they're feeling this crap out just like the rest of us. And all I can say is that Breaking Bad is doing it better than most. Gilligan has said that he has intentionally planted things in scenes knowing how they were going to work out, hoping that people would find them as little Easter eggs. He's also admitted that there were things that showed up in scenes totally unintentionally, that they went back and said, you know what, let's bring that back, even though they hadn't thought about it. So it's, it's essentially both are true. Yeah, I think, I think the problem with the Hamlet theory, I think it fits very nicely. I bet when they were doing the Skinny Pete and Badger scene about Star Trek in episode one, they thought, oh, let's make it look a little Hamlet-y. But the fact that Walt's alive in the flash forward kind of belies, because in Hamlet, Spoiler alert, they all die. Spoiler alert, <laughs> Hamlet's dad is dead. Uh, yeah. All right, man, I, I guess that's it for this episode of The Spoiler Zone. Uh, yeah. We're trying to figure out if there's a way for us to split out The Spoiler Zone as a second release. We're still working out the tech details on that. But uh, if we do, it might be fun. What if The Spoiler Zone became its own thing? Just a crazy idea. Let me put it out there. What if there yeah. was another show called The Spoiler Zone? Let us know what you think, whether we just do it exactly the same way we're doing it, but it'd be a separate feed. Maybe we could leave it at the end of frame rate for those who don't want to subscribe to a second feed. Maybe it would just be a totally separate thing. I think it's a bad I, I, We've decided, uh, my dog likes the second one. We've decided that <laughs> it should probably be the, uh, there's a police car going by. He's like the most, gen, like, I am the most cliche dog. I'm going to pee on fire hydrants and bark at a police car. Uh, but yeah. Uh, we we decided that probably putting both files in the same feed probably is a bad idea. 
Well, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. But but there's something we're experimenting with. If you guys want to chime in, hit us up at fr at twit.tv. Thank you so much. I love you guys. See you later. Drive safely.